Welcome to our 135th anniversary celebration. I'm Jenny Wyman, FMMC's Managing Director. I'm so pleased and honored that FMMC entrusted me with this position after over a century of being completely volunteer-led, an incredible feat. As a lifelong musician myself, the work that FMMC does is indescribably valuable, and working with our membership on a daily basis provides constant inspiration on the importance of music making. It is almost impossible to fathom how long we've been around, 135 years. Over so many decades, a membership that started with just three people grew to 172 by 1909 and now stands at 512 active members. And through the years, we even maintained our original name, the Friday Morning Music Club. Now, the Friday morning part has expanded to all days and times of the week, while the music and the club aspects still hold strong and have expanded greatly over time. Our musical lives keep each of us going, each in our own way. Despite its many arms, the club is now best thought of as our community. It's what binds us together. We strive each day to use this inclusivity as our strength. We'd be long gone by now without the inspired and determined women who got us started and led our growth through the decades. A continuing core of women who cared deeply about the club's role in their personal lives and sustained it with their hard work. It all started in October 1886 with Madeline Beckwith, a 32-year-old single woman who, like single women in the 1880s, lived with her mother and other family members in Northwest Washington. Madeline had some musical training and talent. Musically-minded women in those days had to create their own opportunities to play and be heard. Remember, in 1886, American women had already been striving for several decades to achieve economic and political equality, social reforms, and the right to vote. The suffrage amendment was defeated in 1886 in the U.S. Senate, a particularly frustrating fact as we also celebrate the centennial of the 19th Amendment this year. On census lists and other documents during this era, the occupations of wives and other female relatives living in households were noted as none. We'll be talking more about our fascinating history throughout this broadcast, but it feels only right to preface the program with the realities of the women who came before us. FMMC President Leslie Luxemburg met with Anne McDonough, Deputy Director of the D.C. History Center, last fall to research materials for this special anniversary broadcast. The D.C. History Center has been and continues to be a repository of D.C. history presented from the point of view of actual residents. The Friday Morning Music Club's vast array of archival materials date back to 1890, the first year our written records were officially kept and have been housed in the D.C. History Center since the center's founding in 1894.
Picking back up where we left off with the history of the Friday Morning Music Club, founding member Madeline Beckwith pined for more music in her life and to make music with others. She shared her musical frustrations with her friend Frederica Rogers, age 24. They met with Frederica's school friend, Jeannie Patton, age 31, at her home in Georgetown to talk about starting a group for the study of both instrumental and vocal music. Jeannie would be an asset, having studied with well-known organist and choral director Henry Sherman in Georgetown and at Georgetown Conservatory. The three women soon came up with 12 friends, between them, who could all meet on Friday mornings at 11 a.m. Thus was born our FMMC name. To get to their weekly music house, the women traveled by horse-drawn carriage or streetcar, during the first three years, their meetings were simple and informal, an earnest and sincere group of friends more or less well acquainted with each other, lovers and students of music bound together with the common purpose of giving expression to the art they loved best and of making a beginning for systematic study. By 1891, there were 34 members, and it was time to get more organized. Officers were installed, and a secretary began to record the goings-on. There were new strict rules— each member shall be required to take part in the program at least once in every two weeks, and failing to do so shall find a substitute or pay a fine of 25 cents. The weekly meetings were now held at 16 different residences in Northwest DC and alternated between study sessions and performance events. More and more, our members included professionally trained and socially prominent women, such as pianist Eileen Bell, cousin of Alexander Graham Bell, and Olive Risley Seward, the adopted daughter of President Lincoln's Secretary of State William Seward. In 1890, a new and strong personality entered the club, Edith King, a pianist who had studied at Leipzig Conservatory and at the Paris Conservatory with Félix Le Coupé. An active teacher and performer in Washington, she brought the Kneisel Quartet, the preeminent string quartet of that time, to Washington in 1894, and their appearances continued for the next 13 years under her auspices. For the first three seasons, these concerts were given in her music room on 12th Street Northwest, and after 1897 at her home on S Street Northwest. Starting in 1900, the club now frequently enlisted and paid members of the Washington musical community as invited guests to perform or give lectures at our meetings or at outside venues. FMMC active members now performed only once a month. So my name is Yang Chen, and I'm originally from Taiwan. I came to the States when I was about 17, turning 18 for the Bachelor of Degrees at Eastman. Um, there are a few uh, conservatories actually came to Taiwan for auditions. And I was like, why not? My teacher said, well, you know, they are here in Taipei, Taiwan. Why not just go in and play your auditions? You know, there's nothing to lose. And that really brought me to this different path studying in the States uh, because they actually came to Taiwan for auditions. As a winner of Washington International Competition, was able to play with Avanti Orchestra, 
where the conductor Pablo is just fun to work with. It is really hard to miss this prestigious competition, especially with its rich history representing a wide range of disciplines. And winners receive a lot of casual, uh, casual words and opportunity to perform in recitals or as a soloist with um, orchestras. And the competition always brings in wor world-known judges. I was delighted to meet two of my idols since childhood, Mr. Pressler and Miss Unshine. My teacher was one of the winner, uh, Robert McDonald from Juilliard. Um, he was a winner of this competition back in 1978. And I consider it an honor to join this family of, Wa of Washington International Piano Competition. You know, I actually get to know a lot of organizers. They helped me so much along the way. So I would really encourage the young pianist, you know, don't be afraid to try and enjoy the competition process.
Hello, I'm Sharon Gurton Schaefer. I'm a singer, composer, and life member who joined Friday Morning Music Club after completing an undergraduate degree in the mid 1960s. Now I'd like to tell you about the club's role in starting the National Symphony Orchestra. By the 1930s, Friday Morning Music Club was a well-established cultural and social presence in Washington with several hundred members. In 1931, we were one of five organizations and individuals that gave $5,000 to establish the National Symphony Orchestra. Two people stand out in this story. Hans Kindler, the NSO's first conductor, and Alice Burns, the club's longest tenured president. Hans Kindler, then a Philadelphia Orchestra cellist, had performed in a Friday morning music club concert for the first time in 1916. This was the beginning of a close association with the club. Alice Burns was a significant long-term Friday club powerhouse, an accomplished pianist and organist who had performed in public since childhood. She joined the club in 1897 and ultimately served as president for 20 plus years through 1942. On April 10th, 1931, its weekly program announced, Mr. Hans Kindler will make an appeal to the members of the Friday Morning Music Club for their interest and cooperation in the project of forming a national symphony orchestra. The Sunday Star of October 4th, 1931 revealed more. Capital's oldest music club aids new symphony orchestra. Friday morning group gives $5,000, becoming one of founders. With the inspiration and support of club members, Mr. Kindler became the founder and first permanent NSO conductor. The club's 1931 annual report states, Thanks to the enthusiasm, endurance, and ability of our beloved president, we stood with the foremost in accomplishing a great civic project, the establishment of the National Symphony Orchestra. The club collected donations yearly from members for the NSO's sustaining fund. A mid-year luncheon launched the drive each year. My mother, Edith Kellert, was a member of the Friday Club and very involved in Washington circles of music. And she was a member of the Friday Club. And then at that time, when I was 11, I auditioned as a student member. She loved calling newspapers and getting people to come and, and write articles. When I was 19, I became the youngest pianist to win the Washington International Competition for Pianists. So I have some really fond memories of uh, the competition in 1966, which was held at the Corcoran Gallery of Art. Whoever was in charge came backstage to where we were and said that I had been requested to play the toccata from Ravel's Tombeau de Couperin. And Jonathan, his name was Jonathan Pervin, was going to play the Liszt piano sonata. And I went, well, I don't stand a chance because that piece is so incredible. So out we went, we, we each performed for like under 10 minutes. And then they announced that I had won. And I was like, oh my gosh, wow, <laughs> that's really incredible. My first international competition and I won. <laughs> we had newspapers and there were just articles all over the place we were just shocked by how many there were. It was wonderful, it was like so cool. Word got around real fast and I realized that I had already gotten a lot of support from the members of the Friday Club. And now they started coming to all of my concerts, which was great. I gave one at the Phillips Collection that following December and it was bursting. They had to bring out more chairs. I felt really at home because I could see so many people from the Friday Club and the foundation who had come to support me. And it was just a really good feeling. I was thrilled when they asked me to be a member of the board 
of the foundation and to chair the competition in 2014. And I realized it was a really big responsibility and I embraced it wholeheartedly and was very excited to be involved.
Hello everyone. My name is Grace McFarlane Bottelier, and I serve as the director of the Friday Morning Music Club Foundation. I'm a pianist and a long-time performing member of the Friday Morning Music Club. Along with Junko Takahashi, I also serve as co-chair of the Washington International Competition for Piano. I'd like to tell you about the FMMC Foundation and its prestigious international competitions. The foundation has its roots in the 1944-45 season, when club member Gretchen Hood expressed her wish to leave funds in her will to provide musical education for specially gifted students. This required establishing a foundation as a mechanism for receiving money and other assets. In 1949, Patrick Hayes, former manager of the National Symphony Orchestra, proposed that the foundation share the profits of a series of five concerts in Constitution Hall. The first foundation scholarship audition took place in September of 1950, after nationwide publicity. The club and Mr. Hayes awarded $1,000 jointly to the winner, violinist Diana Steiner. Club members contributed and made enough money through ticket sales at highly publicized concerts to present several awards until 1957. Thus began a mutually beneficial arrangement with the Hayes Concert Bureau, which lasted for nine years, whereby proceeds from concerts presented jointly with Mr. Hayes would go to the foundation. We continued our collaboration with Mr. Hayes until 1965, when he established the Washington Performing Arts Society, the WPAS, a nonprofit enterprise that many of you know, emphasizing cultural and educational programming. Today, the FMMC Foundation sponsors two prestigious international competitions, the annual Washington International Competition for Voice, Piano, and Strings, the WIC, held in a three-year rotation, and the Johansson International Competition, the JIC, for young string players ages 13 through 17. Since 1976, we have also sponsored a competition for composers held in the same year as the WIC Strings competition. The Joe Hansen International Competition, founded in 1997 and held once every three years, is made possible through the generosity of a trust fund established by the late Anna Storch Joe Hansen, an FMMC violinist and life member who left her entire estate to start the JIC. Two of tonight's performers, Beatrice Chen and Julian Rhee, are recent JIC first place winners. Since the Washington International Competition's earliest days, our adjudication panels have been composed of artists of the highest caliber in their musical disciplines. A unique feature of our competitions is the time set aside for judges to share their critiques and insights with each participant individually. We are proud that virtually every winner has gone on to a well-regarded career, often combining teaching with performing, and thus continuing the original mission of keeping classical music alive for future generations. Our Washington International Competition soloists for this broadcast include university professors and distinguished performers alike. For many years, WIC winners were presented in recital at the Phillips Collection as part of their concert series. A noteworthy example being Jesse Norman, who won the WIC in 1968 and then made her recital debut at the Phillips that same year. While every foundation director has been a dedicated and highly regarded musician, including Mary Kay Traver, Thomas Mastroianni, and Frank Conlon, it was particularly fortuitous to have Charlotte Holloman in the position in the 1990s. She was an opera singer and voice teacher who taught at Howard University for over 20 years as the only vocal faculty member. Her career was extensive, consisting of operas in Europe, Broadway shows, even singing backup vocals for Harry Belafonte and James Brown.
my father decided that we would move because he had so much law practice in Washington that we would move to Washington when I was five at the end of the war. And that's when my mother must have found out about this great Friday morning music club. And she immediately became an active member, violinist, performer in the Friday club. They became my surrogate parents, these wonderful ladies, musicians, extraordinary human beings, forming the club, growing it, uh, allying with the National Symphony and all cultural things in Washington. And they grew and grew and grew and grew to what you know today is such a huge cultural event in Washington. And I came to a lot of concerts, a lot of recitals. And uh, well, I remember most the Cosmos Club uh, in the auditorium there. And I became a student member at that time. I think I was 11, 13 years old was a landmark. Uh, I had never entered a real competition and this was the interlocken version. You were in your knickers and sneakers and you played in the outdoors and it was all very beautiful and natural. And stunningly, they gave me the prize as the winner. It was a great privilege to be asked to come back and judge the Washington International Competition several years ago and to be a part of the experience of great young talent being judged by the likes of Menahem Pressler and James Toko and uh, a former student member of the Friday Club. Uh, that was a great moment for me and a great joy to know that those uh, young people were being heard by artists who had heard the great ones of the past and whose teaching and performing was all bound up in this great tradition. One of my special things was as a judge, and I've judged many, many times in many places, is to bond with those who don't win. And just to assure each one that they are just as good as they were the minute before they stepped on the stage as off and that their lives will go in a beautiful direction because God gave them this gift of music and they have developed it to a tremendous degree and each one will follow a, a great path. Competitions are part of our world and uh, Rubenstein used to say, the best part is the preparation and the work and the, the real um, being ready for a challenge. Uh, and that I agree with that very much. Yeah. 
Mary Kay Traver, a pianist member of the Friday Morning Music Club, an honorary member, a life member, a former president and foundation director. Uh, joining the Friday Morning Music Club was an important start to my musical life in the DC area. And it included meeting musicians who would become 
lifelong friends. I've been asked to speak about our history with the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. And in 1960, the Friday Club was a well-connected cultural and social presence in Washington. It was only to be expected that we would support the Kennedy Center mission and find ways to make use of its resources. In 1966, the Friday Morning Music Club Foundation director, Florence Howard, announced her resignation after serving 18 years in that position. And she'd also been a president for many years. And it prompted the club to endow a chair in her name, in her honor, in the Kennedy Center. The center had broken ground just two years earlier. Uh, the Friday Club members contributed to this $1,000 gift. Now we can find Florence's chair in the Kennedy Center Concert Hall. During the 1970s, Abe Fortas, a former Supreme Court Justice, an honorary member of our organization, served as Kennedy Center trustee. As an enthusiastic chamber violinist, he performed often with club members as a guest player in string quartets. For a time, Friday Club considered using the Kennedy Center as our center of operations, all due to Mr. Fortas's connections and encouragement. Well, that was ultimately not possible, but over the years we have maintained our use of the Kennedy Center. From 1974 to 2014, our orchestra performed annually with performances in the concert hall and then in the Terrace Theater. FMMC's Centennial Gala concert was held in October of 1986 in the Terrace Theater, featuring former Washington International Competition winners as soloists with the FMMC Orchestra. A year later, as part of the Centennial, again in 1987, we presented a world premiere in the center of Stephen Burton's commissioned composition entitled, I Have a Dream, based on the words of Martin Luther King. The orchestra was conducted by Robert Gerla and the score included narrator Samuel Bonds. Uh, the soprano was Esther Hines, a past Washington International Competition winner and the University of Maryland Chorus, prepared by my husband, now the late Paul Traver. For over 40 years, our foundation has held the finals of the Washington International Competition at the Kennedy Center. For many of those years, the final rounds took place in the concert hall. In recent years, we have presented our winners in the Terrace Theater. The Friday Morning Music Club values its connection to the center as it continues to bring musical pleasure to the community and to the world of music. Hello, my name is Chung Sun Choi. I'm the competition chair for high school string competition. Now, I would like to tell you a little about FMMC's involvement in student activities. Way back in 1890, each of our 25 members agreed to contribute $4 a year, total $100, for the education of one pupil at the National Conservatory in New York. The members felt their club should also benefit student, thus furthering the development of musical art in America. The club had welcomed individual student members sporadically since 1918, but It wasn't until 1945 that we authorized FMMC members 
who were music teachers to set a student division. Our student members, all from the Washington, D.C. area, continued to participate in their own recital series. The student division also sponsors annual competitions in piano, string, voice, woodwinds, and percussions for area students, as well as a triennial composition competition. Most of the winners of these competitions are now student members of the club. Anne Shine and Bonnie Callert, two of these presentations, distinguished participants were FMMC student members as young girls. In 1965, the club created a major program of educational in-school concert called Concerts in Schools, using specially auditioned volunteers to perform for area public school children. The club provided the performers, open to all area musicians, planned the concerts, and audited the performances. Soon after, the Washington Performing Arts Society, WPAS, now WPA, joined us to manage the program. Now the program is part of a broader education program within WPA that includes music, dance, storytelling, and lectures. We remained co-sponsor until 2018 and our board president still serves on the WPA Board of Directors.
Hello, I'm Mark Simon, and I've been a member since 2008, both as a composer and clarinetist. Composer members have been well represented in club programs since the very beginning. One of the very first was Maud Sewell, a composer, organist, pianist, and violinist who joined the club in 1892 and was still at it in 1950 when she composed Quatrains for Omar Khayyam for the FMMC Chorus. In 1925, the club presented an entire program of the works of Mary Howe, another multi-talented composer and colleague of Hans Kindler. In 1943, FMMC's composers finally organized into an active composers group. In 1969, the group submitted a program to the National Federation of Women's Clubs for an American Women's Composers Award and won first place in the Capital District, which it did again in 1970, 1973, and 1975. FMMC composer Ruth Norman was an inspiring colleague in the 1980s who focused on African Americans in classical music. She introduced works by black composers, along with her own compositions, moving seamlessly from performing to composition, scholarship, and teaching. Today, our 25-member composers group presents several well-attended concerts each year, often using FMMC performance members to play their compositions. We're proud that our composers group provides its members an excellent showcase for their music. The music of two of our composers, me and Jonathan Newmark, is featured in the opening and closing of the broadcast. In addition, recordings of composers group concerts from the 1960s to about 2010 have been digitized and made available to the public. These recordings are housed at the newly renovated Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Library. We hope you'll take some time to listen through the work of over 50 years. My name is Pablo Seltzer, and I am the conductor of the orchestra of the Friday Morning Music Club, which is called Avanti. And I'm from Chile, which is at the end of the world, and I'm at the end of Chile, which is the end of the end of the world. So I had no idea that music would be a, could be a profession. You know, I grew up, my mother sang in a choir, my father played the little organ at church without ever being trained. When I'm working with Avanti, I, I mean, these people make a sacrifice coming to rehearsals. I always think about this. They could be at home having dinner with family or watching their favorite Netflix series. They could be doing whatever, or making money. Instead, they stop, they go out to the car or to the metro and they commute, they come to rehearsal to have a guy, me, in front telling them what to do, when to do it. So these people are really committed. And that energy, I think, translate into when you hear the orchestra, the, the love for the music. Anybody in the orchestra that doesn't, that is offended by me, which wouldn't be that hard, or that doesn't like the repertoire, can stand up in the middle of a rehearsal and walk away, and there's the, there will be no real consequence. People may think, oh, that's a bad thing to do, you know, something like that, but that's all. They can go home at any point. So then the, the objective for me becomes having, keep these people interested, uh, convincing them that doing the best you can, convincing them that preparing at home is absolutely worth it. It's rewarding because every time you play a piece better than you did it before, you realize something about yourself. You inspire the people playing with you or that other, those other people are inspiring you to play better. So it's a virtuous um, circle.
Hello, my name is Michelle Fagus, and I am FMMC's membership chair and vice president. I have been a member of FMMC for two years and have truly enjoyed performing with this organization that has such a long-standing reputation. Our members have been a mix of amateur and professional and everything in between since our beginning, something we pride ourselves on. Our earliest members were lovers and students of music. Soon, women with impressive musical resumes took over club management, establishing high audition and performance standards that remain with us today for our public concerts. Over the years, the club has had to work through what exactly membership means as the world around it changed and grew. For many decades, active members, now called performance members, had voting privileges, but our associate members couldn't vote and even paid higher dues. They also couldn't participate in club administration and had few club-related playing opportunities, except at-home choral and piano groups. FMMC started as an exclusive club. Prospective members had to be nominated and endorsed by two club members, and a successful audition was no guarantee of admittance. Active members could object to the auditioner's admittance. But even in 1893, some members were uncomfortable with this. That year, musical director Edith King asserted that active members must be judged entirely on their musical attainments and not on their social standing. Thankfully, the club became inclusive in 1945, when the club's new constitution allowed successful auditioners to be active performing members with no further review required. Associate members were extended the vote and encouraged to be involved in club management. They organized into piano, string, composers, and choral groups. Like many institutions, FMMC struggled with what inclusivity meant, particularly with regard to race. Our first Black member, professional pianist Vivian Scott, arrived in 1957. Before she auditioned, club members were polled, and only two-thirds were in favor. The board voted to approve the audition application, with 13 in favor and 6 not, before Ms. Scott auditioned successfully and joined the club. And in 1966, we broke our long-standing tradition as a ladies' musical club when we accepted a male pianist by audition. We had been electing male honorary members since 1894, however. George Manos, director of the National Oratorio Society of Washington, D.C., became an honorary member in 1962. That year, he accompanied WIC semifinalists and later conducted the FMMC chorus. Today, adult club members who pass auditions are called performing members and may appear on FMMC's public programs. Associate members participate fully in all aspects of club management. Three at-home groups of associate piano members meet monthly, and anyone can perform in our outreach program, which brings music to seniors. Being part of the Friday Morning Music Club is great because I have a community and especially during the pandemic, I've been performing a lot with my family as part of Friday Morning Music Club. And it's just been a great way to share music with other people and just connect through that. Coming to DC and playing at different venues, playing at Strathmore Mansion, playing here at Dumbarton House, you know, playing in Virginia and just a level of commitment of everyone involved. Participating in the Johansson International Competition uh, really made me a better musician and it was a huge stepping stone in my development. It was really, it was a real coming of age for me. And yeah, once I won, I started to feel more confident about myself and my abilities as a musician. You know, when you learn an instrument, you have to put together a lot of different information at once. You know, what's your left hand doing and your right hand. When I was little, I played piano. I played a little bit of violin. And eventually I settled on viola because I could have my own voice on it. I think it's always the voice and not the vocal voice, but the, the 
the voice that's inside your heart? Um, so when I first started viola, I was looking up uh, videos of violists on YouTube to listen to, and I happened upon a recording of the winner's recital of the Johansson International Competition. She started showing me videos. She showed me Jesus' video. And she's like, oh, you know, I'm working on this piece too. You know, Jesus played it. And there's this competition, you know, in the, the church where the winner's concert is. And I was really inspired. And I told myself one day I'll go there and perform. And yeah, four years later, I went and I won. <laughs> Thank you. 
I'm soprano Peggy McNulty, and I'm proud to be part of a select group of Friday Morning Music Club Life members. Currently, 26 of us have been members for more than 50 years and are still active. Half are pianists, and the remainder distributed among singers, violinists, and cellists. In addition to our group, 94 people have been with Friday Club for 25 to 49 years. Not bad out of a total membership of around 500. Participating in Friday Club's programs has given me an incentive to learn new repertoire and maintain my vocal technique. The ongoing performance opportunities in a variety of settings, as well as the chance to collaborate with equally enthusiastic colleagues, are motivating factors for all our long-term members. Several in our life members group had mothers who were also members, including Doris Godsda Anne Shine and Bonnie Kellert. For members who moved to the D.C. area, in some cases coming from abroad, club membership facilitated meeting like-minded callings in the area and fostered long-term friendships. For Anne Myonzuk Lee, who came here from Korea, it eased her transition to the Western classical music tradition and enabled her to develop professional musical contacts. The commitment of all our long-term members has enabled our all-volunteer organization to continue thriving all these years. As you know, it wasn't until last year that we hired our first managing director. That speaks to the level of care and dedication of our membership.
I'm Leslie Luxemburg. I'm a singer, and I am the 41st president of the Friday Morning Music Club. Thank you so much for joining us on our special journey through the history of the Friday Morning Music Club and sharing some special performances with us along the way. Challenging times like these invite creative solutions like this broadcast. During World War II, the membership created non-serious programs, subsequently titled Frolics, to counteract the mood of the time. Starting in 1942 with the fantastic fricassee, these humorous skits continued up until 1959, usually being performed during the annual spring luncheon. Going back to the time of the influenza pandemic in 1918, when D.C. had one of the worst outbreaks in the nation, largely due to the influx of military personnel, we know that all public gatherings were canceled starting that October. There was a notable drop in FMMC membership during this period as a result. Club membership has fluctuated, due to the changing role of women in our society. Up until World War II, when the majority of women did not work outside the home, it was not difficult to attract a robust membership. Starting in 1946, more women joined the workforce and so had less time for weekday activities and concerts. Time and time again, we were able to reinvent ourselves and strive forward by becoming more inclusive, enlarging our pool of members, allowing men to join, and extending our mission to include musical education and the support of emerging artists by establishing and developing the foundation and its noteworthy competitions. The predominant theme of our history, which has kept us going for all these years, is our devotion to and passion for classical music. The practice and sharing of music have enabled us to persevere and thrive in such a way as to arrive at this, our 135th year. We are delighted you have come along with us on this fascinating and inspiring journey, and we invite you to join us in a final toast to the enduring future of the Friday Morning Music Club. Santé! Prost! Skoll! Cheers! <laughs>
Thank you.